Uh, it gives me a lot of pleasure this morning to introduce you to Professor Mike Farrell. For those of you who don't know, uh, Mike is Director of the National Drug and Alcohol Research Centre. Uh, prior to joining NDARC, uh, he was Professor of Addiction Psychiatry at the Institute of Psychiatry in King's College, London. He's got a long-standing interest in drug dependence in prisons and within the wider criminal justice system. He's been a member of the World Health Organization Expert Committee on Drug and Alcohol Dependence since 1995. Uh, he also chaired the World Health Organization external evaluation of the Swiss heroin trial. It's a great honor to have him with us today to talk to you about emerging trends in drug and alcohol research. So would you please join me in welcoming Professor Farrell. Good morning and uh, thanks very much, Don. It's always nice to um, come and have some contact with Boxer, who I'm always impressed with the statistics they come out with, and in particular the confident interpretation of those. Um, I, I was asked by Don to co just to, to throw in the kitchen sink, basically, and cover trends and, and look at trends around um, drug use, and us trying to make some sense out of what's happening. Now, one of the problems in trying to do that in the drug field is that nothing ever quite fits together, so we end up having different bits and pieces and trying to look at it and having half of the jigsaw puzzle pieces and then trying to figure out what the picture looks like with only half of the pieces. So I'm presenting so a range of monitoring stuff that is done. I'd like to feel, <coughs> if people want to ask questions, um, we, we, I hope to have a reasonable amount of question time. And the only first apology I need to make is that there seems to be some incompatibility with my more up-to-date PowerPoint and the slightly less up-to-date system I've keyed into. So at this moment in time, I'm not sure how many of the graphs will be unreadable, but I'm, I'm happy to talk through them anyway. And, you know, the stuff isn't that complicated when it comes to it. We do have to simply, this is just to introduce my organization, National Drug and Alcohol Research Center. It's been going for 25 years. I've been there for two years, and our mission really is to conduct high-quality research around drug issues and for, with a focus on translation and impact both uh, broadly socially and on treatment and to provide expertise. And I think with former directors and with the staff in it, it has done that quite well over quite a period of time. To start, and this is just the big picture in relation to burden of disease and looking at um, <clears throat> the issue, and you see up here that um, while much of, most of the talk today is on illicits, you see um, in relation to the burden of disease, and this is all directed, t t taken from the um, World Health Organization, Global Burden of Disease, uh, work, but quite a bit done by Louise, my colleague Louise at Egenhart and Endark. But you see that tobacco and alcohol form a far greater amount of it than the illicits. Um, and <coughs> one of the interesting things socially is the debate we're having now about the balance of where, where are our greater concerns. I think today one of the things I'll focus a bit on is the emerging synthetic drugs, because that's an area people are concerned about. Whether we should be as concerned about it is a, a thing we can actually cover in our discussion. This is um, just looking, and it's, it's a bit out of date, but it's, it's actually the data hasn't changed much. It's looking at trends in alcohol consumption and population alcohol consumption. And it's, um, it may not be quite a flat line, but it's not far off a flat line. So a lot of our discussion about concerns around alcohol don't come from per capita al alcohol consumption, but they come from sub-bits within it, which is both um, drinking hours, licensing hours, and some of the consequences around that. What we're actually, what w the data we have is macro data, and we think we need far better data in terms of patterning of drinking in young people to make more sense out of some of the divergence between what looks like a sort of flat line in terms of general consumption and what are clearly very evident social harms around um, the nighttime drinking culture. And again, in the context of 
Um, this is data on, you know, um, people hitting the treatment system. And again, you see that alcohol is the biggest um, single demand on uh, treatment responses. And that's not surprising because it's, um, not, you know, 80% plus of the population are consuming alcohol. And uh, the, the <coughs> I'm not going to show you data on it here, but I think that one of the things we need to appreciate in relation to tobacco is that the one really big success story we have to talk about the last decade outside of HIV levels among injecting drug users is the fall in the level of smoking in the general population. And one of the things we need to understand about that, and not all of you in the audience, but many of us in the audience are looking forward to a, a long life. And one of the reasons for that isn't because we're being fed better or we're getting better pensions. It's actually because a lot have stopped smoking, and that's actually added, that's accounting for about <coughs> up to 80% of the variance in longevity. So the impact on changing smoking is dramatic. But probably from our point of view, what's more important is is the notion of when we talk about prevention, there's a tendency for us to feel a bit nihilistic about what we can do about prevention. And, and the smoking, the example of the fall in smoking, is a very successful prevention strategy. It's actually a clear and coherent position that has been adopted on the basis of the harms of tobacco and a target to reduce the population of smoking, and it's continuing to go down. The question is, are we reaching the hardcore now, and is it going to be harder? And then there's all sorts of other debates, but I won't get into those now. So I was going to use this morning, we've got three systems of, we've, we do a fair amount of work around national household data, which is collected by AHW and the, and the general population surveys, but they only occur once every three years. We also have um, a panel which is an opportunistic panel of a thousand drug injectors around the country um, that we recruit once a year to look at trends and patterns of use among that subpopulation because they perform they constitute less than um, be less than two percent of the overall population so that the data on the household survey doesn't come out very well and we also look at patterns of sort of non injecting use which is really what some people call pill users our party users, and, and look at the patterns of drugs and the reporting trends around those. And the, together that gives us a broader picture of the sort of things that's happening. And what I've done to, to sort of confuse you a bit is I've actually mixed them all together so you won't know which sample I'm talking about at any point in time. And I've talked around some of the substances. Um, now this is, this first one you can see up there, this is actually the sub-panel of in, in injecting drug users, but what you can see over on the right is the national sample, and that's the prevalence. And you see that there's basically the, one of the other good news stories for us around heroin use is if you go back to the mid-90s, we were in the eye of a storm. You had Cabramatta, you had huge problems, massive overdoses, and a sense of people really, f communities feeling out of control. What we have now is we have an aging heroin dependent population. We don't we, we, we are obviously recruiting some new users, but it seems to be uh, remarkably stable. And in comparison to 20 years ago, uh, that is a remarkable outcome. How to explain it, I think is, is far more difficult. I mean, I can give you speculative notions with the, the the speculative notion really is that if you get a very evident problem in the population and people see it's an evident problem, it, it does actually have an impact on people's sort of likelihood of engaging in that behavior. And that what happens is you then get a generation, you skip a generation. Unfortunately, on that theory, we need to be quite wary about what comes next because the theory of skipping a generation is that the following generation has forgotten the lesson of the current generation and you get a new problem. We've no evidence of that at the moment, but it's something, there, there's some other stuff to see in heroin that are quite interesting. Um, <coughs> this is just looking at heroin overdoses 
in the last month, and you come across this time and again. There was a huge drop at the turn, start of the new century, and it's never quite come back up, um, which indicated there was a fall in uh, supply of heroin, basically. And, um, you, and one of the things we find is that one of the best ways of figuring out how, much, how many heroin users there are in the population, particularly heroin injectors, is you can get the, over, the overdose death rate and multiply by 100 and you've got your figure and you can get rid of all of those complicated research activities. Um, <clears throat> so, and here we have um, accidental overdose-related deaths in the full age group. And the reason I put this up is because you can see at the, e at the end here we're seeing something different happening and we're getting a bit of a climb. And the question is, well, what's happening there? Because we, we don't seem to be getting new young heroin users in, and yet we're getting this climb. Now, those three figures are simply that this is work done by Amanda Roxburgh, and that's her being getting more and more precise with time in relation to um, as the data, the data comes in, it needs to be corrected. But if we look at it in actual fact, the, the interesting <laughs> thing, if you look here, you will see... Um, that it's the actual older adult population. Now, there's two bits to that. One of that could be, well, that's because we've got an ageing um, um, heroin, opiate-dependent population, but it's actually probably something more complicated, which is um, we've got a sort of new problem on our hands, which is while we've talked about the... We, we, our whole approach to opiate dependence has been setting up methadone clinics, organizing, trying to get people not to go through prison, into treatment, etc., etc. But what we're actually seeing is we're seeing a growth in the chronic pain population, uh, the older adult population, with prescription opioid dependence. Now, this is actually still quite modest by um, international standards, particularly by the standards in the United States, where they have a, a, a huge problem. But what you see, that, that purple line, the one, I, I particularly like lines that go up like that because they're the easiest to understand. But you can see that's oxycodone, and it's, uh, you're seeing it's, it's climbing. And I think we've got, this is oxycodone-related deaths. Um, and what you can see here is also, um, the, the, some of the later stuff is probably just not complete data. But one of the important points here is when you correct for the amount of prescription of oxycodone, the actual amount of deaths is sort of level, so in terms of per prescription. But the, ma the main message really we have is that this population, and one of the concerns around this population is, of course, is we know it's a fairly substantially expanding population, and over the next decade, it's set to double. So, and if the trends carry on, we think we will have a fairly substantial problem in older adult opiate dependence. And we're particularly concerned in relation to the systems we have in place at the moment would be pointing in slightly the wrong direction. And we need to probably look to see that they're far more in primary care, far more uh, diversified in relation to getting at this population, but that's, that's a discussion that we're having. And then this is one other one that people are concerned about, is where this is fentanyl prescriptions, which is fentanyl is a, a synthetic long-acting opiate, and it's um, in, prescribed in patches for chronic pain, and it's, it's regarded as particularly effective, but it's also been heavily marketed. And what you see here is it's, it's gone up quite substantially, and lo and behold, we've also seen two aspects of that that I won't present data to you on, but a rise in the number of fentanyl-related deaths, some of those just straightforward polydrug deaths, but also a significant subgroup of injectors dying in which diver diversion of the fentanyl patches are being used and, and we're getting overdose deaths. The numbers are actually still modest enough, but the trend is, is worth being concerned about. Now, this is um, just a slightly, just as on the theme of opiates, I thought I'd um, do one of my favorite things, which is the study on the right here 
uh, is England, Scotland, New South Wales, and the United States. And this is a question that was asked is, well, what happens? The theory was that when people come out of prison, they've lost their tolerance and they overdose. And that actually, they, well, here, this is a very testable hypothesis. So what you do is you, you, you get people and you track them over, um, ideally one month to six months after release. And what you see is the, 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 the bar here is the, is the first week. And then, and this is the first year, um, our first, I think it is actually, it's um, <coughs> first five to 12 weeks actually. But what you see in all of them is a dramatic um, increase, the, the, anything from 30 to 50 times uh, the risk of death in the first week after release, which drops really by the end of the third to fourth week, and then is a standard elevated risk for that population. And this is a very robust finding now across an, a number of jurisdictions. And then the question this leaves us with is, well, what do we do about it? We bring these people into prison. We either detox them or maintain them. Even if we have a standard maintenance program, a substantial number of people don't necessarily want to be on maintenance in prison for a range of reasons. And then when they go back out, they're actually at risk of overdose. So there's a challenge for us in figuring out what we do around that. Um, this is other drugs, but it's not actually other drugs per se. It's about uh, the, uh, looking at um, opioid substitution treatment in terms of the injecting population. And what we're actually seeing is, while methadone is the staid staple thing, we're seeing things like the new the buprenorphine and... Uh, suboxone, which is a mixture of buprenorphine and naloxone coming in, um, but that's so much that we've mentioned about these other things. So, so <coughs> actually, if we so we've covered the heroin and and that sort of problem, and that's um, the, probably the next really sort of tough drug that we worry a lot about is methamphetamine, and the <coughs> people will know. We're sitting bang in the middle of a region where um, internationally there's a major amount of methamphetamine production. The theory is that most of it is in China. There's probably some in other regions like um, Myanmar or Cambodia. It's a, it's a bit speculative where it is, but there's no question that, um, one, it's a major problem within the region, and two, that Australia is a fairly sitting duck in relation to having money to pay for the drugs. And I think that's one of the things that the theory is that the strong dollar has been um, made Australia more attractive for trafficking of drugs. So methamphetamine, the, the good news about methamphetamine is we've been worried about it for a decade and we're not as worried about it as we thought we would be from the point of view it hasn't become as big a problem as we expected it to be, thank goodness. Um, this is looking at um, the, if we look at the household population, I think you see, actually these are not insubstantial figures for a drug that's quite a, a nasty drug for people to be using, um, lifetime use and recent use in this period. In a, in a but what, what we do see, if we, we try to think of the, the, this hardcore population, as indicative of trends of what's happening. And what we actually see is things like crystal meth going up. So some of the ones, the pure methamphetamine that we associate with more problems climbing up and some of the other ones going down, um, which is <coughs> just an emerging trend and something that we need to keep an eye on. And this is where we see across all of the jurisdictions we see um, that the, the figures are going up for methamphetamine in virtually all jurisdictions except for Queensland. These are just... So that's methamphetamine. Now, the other interesting one is cocaine because, actually, cocaine is not really very much an Australian drug, in a, in a sense. It, it has to get quite a distance to get here, and traditionally it hasn't tended to. But, actually, we've seen... A bit of a change in that, and this is this is in actual fact traditionally uh, 
the injectors tend to use crack and not powder cocaine. And one of the interesting things for us about cocaine, if we look over here, is that the rates of use in the general population, these are actually quite high when it comes to class A drugs. And, that, and one of the things, I'm not sure if I have a slide of it here, but I'll talk about it before going ahead, which is what we've actually seen in, in the recent stuff, which is particularly in New South Wales, we've seen quite a lot of powder cocaine, and we've seen uh, females, nearly as many females, young females, reporting powder cocaine use as, as young males. And it's quite unusual to see the females catching up with the males. We're concerned around this, around all substance use, that there's been a closing of the, the traditional gender gap, the two-to-one gender gap. And um, the thing about it is that it's actually been pretty modest use. It's reporting two or three times episode of use in a year. So it's not really something that you'd expect huge problems about, but it's quite an interesting trend. And this shows you where New South Wales stands out on its own. It's actually using far more cocaine than a any other jurisdiction, which um, is... I I'm open to suggestions of why that should be so different. Um, you wouldn't, you'd expect Victoria and New South Wales to reflect each other if you were talking about economic profile and if you're talking about... Uh, the, the general view is the powder cocaine is being used by... Um, the, the classic quotation about cocaine from Robin Williams was that it was God's way of telling you you had too much money, and that... <laughs> And that remains the case. Um, so, and then just quickly, cannabis. The, the, this is actually with the injectors, but what you see here is 80% of them are reporting cannabis use at, uh, uh, on an ongoing, and that's really flat and it's rock solid and it hasn't changed very much. The criticism both of both cannabis and smoking of the treatment services would be that there's probably a big, big burden of disease around both tobacco smoking and cannabis and very little done about it. I mean, it's probably not easy to ship, but there's not much done about it. And then over here, you've got the household population and you've got, this is our most favorite illegal drug, without a question. And um, it's, I think we've got a few slides here. If we look at it, um, it accounts, in terms of the age group, the youngest age group. Now, I put this up simply because what's happening here? What are we seeing here? Any, any notion? This is the baby boomer. This is the post-war generation coming into their pensions. <laughs> and um, they're not just drinking gin and tonics. Some of them are rolling up joints and thinking that's what they want to do is enjoy the sunset. And that's actually, along with the opiates, it suggests that there's a demographic trend both around alcohol, cannabis, and uh, some prescription medication that is different than the pre-war generation. It, my, my own guess about it is that the, the post-war generation is not as stoical as their predecessors, and I don't think most people will argue with that. Um, but um, it, it is thing, it, it, it seems modest, and the area of interest, the areas we've been having discussion around it is particularly about memory, brain, and aging and understanding whether there's... Because there's a lot of concern around Alzheimer's and uh, dementias. And really, a lot of the discussion has been around genetics and discovering new treatments. And one of the arguments we're making is actually the place we need to be looking at is around lifestyle and the impact of lifestyle on cognitive functioning. And the real question is, <clears throat> it's not necessarily um, that it's the lifestyle when, when, of the age when you're beginning to dement. It might be the lifestyle for the previous 25 years. So we may have long-term lead-in time. So there's a need for us to tease out this in a way from a prevention and a lifestyle and behavioral healthy older population than, than, than we have done to date, and there's a lot of interest in it. Um, and this just shows, <laughs> the, in the National Household Survey, cannabis use, um, 
the, the thing we seem to see is that it, it's, we're expecting it. It's sort of been trending down until 2010 when it seems to have popped up a bit. And, um, but pretty stable and probably the issue being um, a hardcore of more frequent users. And if we look at that, um, here we see in the 2010 thing the numbers who are using um, once or twice a year versus the numbers who are using daily, 13%. And I, I, this is the, it's the more frequent population that I think we were more concerned about. And the general assumption is that the bigger number of episodic users you have, that proportionately to tailor that in terms of daily use. But the, the concern really is around daily use. And particularly the concern is about young people and daily use. Um, even though what you're seeing here in the younger population here, it looks to be going down a bit, um, which is, we, we, we have an inkling that the younger population are sort of moving away from cannabis a bit, but what you're seeing here is the older group actually being involved in more intense use. So it's again, it's, it's a the question of unpacking trends within the population, and um, we, we, we continue to try to make sense of it. The, the general sense is that the levels of cannabis use are high enough that the, there's a far better chance of them going down than there is of them going up. If things are high, they tend to come down, and if they're low, they tend to go up, so I think so. Um, <clears throat> this is just actually, um, I, I leave most of the criminal statistics to Dan, but actually, and this is, this is simply a panel of people involved in injecting drug use, and it's not a representative population. But what you do see is, in actual fact, um, crime going down. Um, and this isn't a treatment effect or anything. It's simply a description. And it's actually not inconsistent with the data we're seeing uh, across crime in general, property crime going down. Uh, and, uh, but it, I wouldn't make too much out of it. Now, if we go on, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the, the other types of drugs, which are a source of concern for us. And, that's, um, and th this is where we have a panel of people who are involved, moderately involved in psychostimulant type use. And if we look at it, um, what, what I'm struck by when you look at this panel is the range of different drugs people are involved in, alcohol, cannabis, methamphetamine, cocaine, LSD, benzodiazepines, emerging psychoactive drugs, mushrooms. You, I mean, you name it, the list goes on. And <laughs> what, you're, what you're seeing in this group, which is the interesting thing here, is you're seeing ecstasy going down. The, the, the general view is that the purity of ecstasy had fallen off, and that, that's one of the main explanatory factors for the fall off in it. And actually, alcohol is the drug of choice coming up, which wouldn't be consistent with, which would be consistent with some of our stuff around um, some of the nighttime entertainment issues. But they're they're probably too much a subgroup to generalise about. Um, so that's simply looking at ecstasy and showing um, ever use and use in the last 12 months and use around 3% in the last 12 months still. But um, the, the uh, only other thing there is variance on the type of use, but I won't get into it in too much detail because I want to talk a bit about emerging psychoactive drugs. Now, I d I'm sure most of you are aware from some of the media coverage is that one of the, uh, one of the drivers in terms of the game changers around illicit drugs has been the emergence of new technology, which is called the Internet, and the use of the Internet to actually uh, promote information about a range of drugs, and actually also the use of the Internet to actually market awareness about new types of drugs. And on top of that, what we have is a situation where in this region uh, <coughs> we have where you get the production of methamphetamine, you've probably got the facilities to produce a range of other drugs because you've got a basic laboratory, you've got a little um, recipe book, you get it out and you, you can make a range of drugs and there is 
there's a chap who was a DA lab analyst called Alexander Shelgan, and he wrote a book called Phenylketyl Amines I Have Known and Loved, and it's the size of a telephone directory with um, the <laughs> formula for about 300 different psychoactive drugs. And people are using this to make different drugs. But the, the, the issue for us is that we need to be a bit careful in thinking about this. Is what people in general are quite shocked about is the idea that people can go into a shop and buy chronic or buy some of these bath salts, go out, and that they're legal. Um, the issue being that the, um, <coughs> in some of the cases, the um, formulations have been crafted specifically to avoid, um, to get around the current drug laws. However, one of the issues for us is that we know for the last 15 years, when we ask young people about access to illegal drugs, they have ready access to illegal drugs. So things have not changed as much as we believe they have, but it seems an anachronistic to people, the idea that people can simply go in and buy things. What, they're particularly, what we're particularly concerned about in relation to things like chronic, and that is that actually what's in the packet is not what's labelled on the packet, so there's considerable misrepresentation around it. Um, sorry, now. So one of the things we've done around this is we've been trying to figure out, well, how do you get your head around this? How do you figure out what's happening? And we, we've got the traditional methods, which is interviewing people and asking them what they take and that sort of thing, but, and targeted sample service. But the other thing we've introduced into it is the other thing that this enables is, well, you can monitor what's happening on the Internet. You can see what the searches are. You can see where the interest is, and you can actually monitor the emerging trends. So that's what we've started trying to do. And um, what you see, if we look at it here, um, and this is reported use. What you see, first of all, is that these things are changing. In, in uh, methadrone, <coughs> firstly available in, and, and a big drop off, methylone, th these different types of drugs, that one coming up, and chronic. So it's a very, one, the first thing we see is it's a pretty dynamic market with things changing. You'll hear about so many different drugs, it's confusing. And the easiest way to think about it is there's three types. There's can synthetic cannabinoids and there's stimulants, which is like uh, variants on amphetamines, and then there's hallucinogens. They're the three main categories. There's, there's hundreds of different ways of describing it, but they're the three main categories. And here we've talked about just, uh, we've divided them out between the stimulants, which is a mixture of hallucinogens and stimulants, and the synthetic cannabinoids. And you can see <coughs> that these ones are <coughs> reported. And this, this is data from the panel of um, EDRS panel. So they're pretty much uh, a fairly um, consistent group of users. And yet the levels here are quite modest. They're, they're much lower than we would have expected them to be. And the only thing we can infer from this is that general population levels we would expect to be lower. Um, <clears throat> so the, the next thing we did was we looked around uh, the Internet to see what was sort of happening. And this is, there's two levels in the Internet. There's what we call, there's the, <clears throat> the surface, this one, and then there's Silk Road. People, I presume in the media, have heard about the Silk Road, but basically... Um, there's, uh, that's one main area, but it's, it's mainly w within the Internet is what people call the dark side of it, which is a place where you can com convey or undertake transactions without being traceable um, in those transactions. And actually, you can, you can go on the Silk Road and look up, and there's a range of different drugs available. The point of this is so that you're seeing the growth... This is fairly flat on the surface in terms of retailers, but it's actually grown quite a bit on this thing. But what we have seen is that actually it's technically quite... It takes a bit of skill to get onto the, the dark side of the Internet and uh, onto the Silk Road. And what we've seen is that not many people 
are actually accessing it. Most people that we, we, we are interviewing are actually simply these drugs they're they're buying they're buying off friends they're not actually getting off the internet only a small number are but when you look at what is actually sold and this is simply monitoring on the internet what's sold you see this drug here nbom is the drug that that young chap in in north sydney who fell off the balcony had taken and you see dm you see there's a range of these drugs available um and these two being the main ones. And um, you see there's also a range of other, a wide range of drugs available. Um, if we look at it in terms of price, you see the prices on the internet are substantially um, lower. Um, this, is the, well, this is the median international price, and this is the domestic price. So, um, <clears throat> and this is coming back to the point around the types of drugs available, but I won't, I won't I'll drop that. So, so the issue around the emerging psychoactives has been that it's, it, it really is aggressive marketing, um, and the penetration, our reading, even though we've got to be careful about how uh, robust our interpretation, but our reading at the moment is that the penetration of the Australian market is quite modest, particularly by European standards, particularly in relation to the range of drugs both being transacted across that thing, but that it remains a very potent area for fairly aggressive marketing. And also, um, it has the potential in relation to technology and innovation around drug distribution to really become the key player around how all drugs are transacted, and that, that is potentially quite a big challenge for enforcement. The argument on the other side is that they'll also be in on the same level monitoring what's happening, and like everything in terms of modern-day surveillance, there'll be nothing you do on the Internet that we won't know about. So if you look at it, though, in relation to responses, and this is just a schematic approach to it, if we look at it in terms of the, 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 the demand then is to say, well, we must ban these things. And I think what my thing to say is we need to be a bit cautious about not getting too trigger-happy about banning things and thinking about our options. We have options around consumer protection, which is that if things are actually marketed and they're not what they um, are made out to be, there's, there's laws around that to actually enact to see that people have... And then we've got issues around medicines, we've got medical control, and then we've got the drug laws. And actually, I think we need to be careful not to resort instantly to the drug laws. One of the reasons we're concerned about this is um, banning may not be as simple. There may be counterproductive effects of banning. One is us understanding and conveying to people the real harms. We need to be clear what the harms are. And two is um, so, so that people will take them on board and enact them. But two is that there is the risk that once we ban things, if people have bought them and they're in possession of them, they may be subject to fairly serious criminal sanctions for possession of illegal substances where they're not actually clear what's legal and what's illegal. So it's, it's not uncomplicated. And from that point of view... Um, the, there's no doubt that this process is wrong-footing people from the point of view of particularly politicians, par parents quite concerned, and actually new people are always afraid of new technologies. It generates anxiety. And actually, the, we need to be clear that we get a measured response and we, we figure out and we, we're, we're pretty sensible in our response and we don't overreact. And I think... Um, I think we can just finish on that. I'm sure, um, I'm sure there are questions in the audience. Anybody got a question? We've got microphones, I think, on both.
Is that because they're into um, stronger drugs or do they just f stop using the cannabis? Um, I, I think the issue with cannabis is, as I said, if the levels are very high, the chances are, again, you're getting a generational effect. I mean, this is quite speculative, but we do hear that some, some youngsters think that some of the older ones are a bit old-fashioned, you know, that they talk about stoners and they're not. But I don't ha I'm not aware of it being that they've gone on to other drugs. Cannabis is very much the bedrock of the illicit consumption, and, and so I, I don't think it's... However, it's always difficult to interpret notions of switching because it involves figuring out what, why, why people did things, which is very hard. alleviation or something like that? Um, <clears throat> well, not in my own case. <laughs> <laughs> now, yours is just for pleasure. Just for pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, the, the, there's a lot of interest, of course, in cannabis, or medicinal cannabis. The data on pain alleviation is actually pretty weak. Um, however, we are, we are doing a study um, on... Uh, we're recruiting over a thousand people with chronic pain who are who are starting on opiates in pharmacies around the country to look at what happens. And, and one of the things we have noticed is a number of we've put some questions in around cannabis, and not insubstantial numbers are reporting cannabis consumption. So there's something interesting there, but it it may it may be what you might call palliation rather than direct. Um, you know, it's it's some if people are. I suspect if somebody hasn't used cannabis before, they're not going to start using it for that end because they're not going to like quite a lot of the subjective effects. If they're if they're used to it, they'll um, approach it quite differently. One of the motivations in the early 90s for introducing drug testing in workplaces was the idea that this was going to affect the overall drug use in the population. Given that that's grown significantly over the last 15 years or so, has there been any work looking at whether that effect has actually eventuated? Um, I mean, I don't know, Don, you might have. I don't, I don't, I've never heard anybody claim that the... Uh, effects for other than within the targeted population. You'd actually want to talk about, you can talk about we've got a population, a workforce, and, and particularly in, we say, machinery sensitive industries like transport and that sort of thing, people are able to confidently report we've actually reduced our positive testing rate down. I, d I haven't seen people claim that it'll affect the general pop population levels of consumption anywhere, but um, I, I, I think one of the interesting issues about some of the new synthetics has been the claim that some of the screening tests don't detect them and that that's actually been quite a boon for them in relation to uh, particularly the synthetic cannabinoids, that it's, uh, it's particularly in the mining industry, that it's been quite a boon for them because uh, people have been sort of aware that they won't be screened for them. And of course, then now people are trying to play catch up on that. Wondering how is uh, the issue of accidental deaths being measured or assessed or determined? Well, I can tell you what we're doing within our monitoring system is we get out all the reports, but they take quite a bit of time to come in. And, and as with all of these deaths, they're never single substance deaths. They're usually um, a, mixture, a mixture of drugs. And, um, you know... <coughs> you you look at them and collate them and see, and I would say at the moment the figures are quite modest, but but they're trending in the wrong direction. I can see someone. I was just wondering if you knew of any research focusing on um, drug use amongst people with intellectual disability. Yeah, I mean, there's the in terms of substance use, the there we regard it as a particularly vulnerable population that doesn't fall within the 
it, one, it doesn't fall within the remit of existing treatment services very well. Um, there's a tendency for it to overburden the criminal justice system because they, and at the moment I think the view is that they're not a well-served population. Um, what I'm not, I, I think, what I'm not convinced by is the notion that this is a ubiquitous problem. The issue tends to be when you've got people with problems, they really tend to be quite magnified. And they tend to, so it's quite hard to get the scale. The scale of the thing, in my view, would be alcohol is probably a far bigger problem from that point of view. But that actually, um, in general, it's viewed as um, a vulnerable and underserved population. I mean, the traditional dexamphetamine population, who used to also inject a bit, in my view, when we did, when we did the big. Um, prison prevalence surveys, we found actually there were far more of them than there were of the heroin users, mm -hmm. but they just stay off the radar system because they don't come into treatment, they don't come into treatment much in there, so they're, they're hard to get a, a handle on. Um, there's a general view that when it comes to injectors, there's a large overlap between the heroin injectors and the methamphetamine injectors. Um, the <coughs> I think that the situation is it's, uh, we're, it's easier to think about it as a supply issue. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things we were talking about earlier, you, you, last year, late last year, you had half a tonne of methamphetamine seized, and you're thinking, well, that's, a, that's a one hell of a lot of methamphetamine. And if you, you generally tend to think people only get a third to a half of what's coming through, um, but it doesn't look like there's that amount of methamphetamine floating about in the system. Well, I, w I would, <laughs> you know. Anybody else got I'm, a I'm question? Them, I think. We've got a little while before morning tea and you can get that refreshment you need. It won't be Yes, over there. I'm just wondering what thoughts you have about whether there's a trend towards pharmaceutical opiates replacing heroin yeah. in the population? Just yeah, I, d I don't think we've seen that here yet. That there's, that's clearly um, a phenomenon in the United States. You get stuff, you've got cohorts in Kentucky, Kentucky of people who start, young people who start on, on um, OxyContin and then progress on to heroin. Um, I, we haven't seen anything like that to date here. We're, we're interested to think about how we might be sort of looking for it. Um, I think the, the levels of prescription overall are still, uh, the, the argument is they're still below the threshold that the states went to where mm -hmm. they, the problem really took off. And I think it's one, one of the things, there's a national pharmaceutical strategy and one of the things is actually keeping a grip on some of the prescription. One of the problems around prescription opiate dependence is we assume that it all comes either from prescribing or from diversion of prescribed pharmaceuticals, whereas I think we need to be aware that there's the potential for wholesale diversion and for larger scale diversion. If you're getting big population effects, the chances are it's not a bunch of errant doctors. It's actually something, something bigger. You can't get big population effects from um, bits of prescribing are what the tabloids love to talk about, which is granny drug dealing. Well, there yeah. was one in Leeton, wasn't it? There's bound to be a police person in the audience who remembers this person. Grandmother selling pharmaceutical opioids in large quantities. I was going to ask you that. Has anybody done any work looking at whether doctors <coughs> in certain suburbs are coming under pressure from patients to prescribe them or stood over to prescribe them? Well, I think they've all, they're, they're being under pressure from people with pain. Who Part of the difficulty is you've got pain, you, you want opiates, but the problem is you're then going to develop. Uh, you have a fair chance if it's, if it's a chronic pain and you start on opiates that you're going to not come off them again. You're going to get dependent on them. That may be well And the, the issue, I think, with the pain world is they started from the point of view that it was simply a question of giving people things they needed. Right. And I think they're sort of moving towards the thing of realising, actually, it's a bit more complicated than that. And actually, there's a need for structure around it and um, monitoring and due care and attention. And it's not that some people with pain don't need them and can't benefit from them. It's just 
making sure that you're not making complications for people that are avoidable. Right. It's a it's a complex area, but there's a a lot of need for education and uh, development. I just would be interested in getting your comments on the perception that um, the use of MS content and oxycodone is almost like a street-based pharmacotherapy in itself as an alternative to heroin use. And there's a bit of a reluctance on behalf of health providers to investigate that further because of this perception that it's, it's a safer alternative to heroin use. Yeah, I, I mean, the, 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 there's data from the injecting centre of people reporting... Um, specifically oxycodone injecting and that, but there's not big data on that, but it's something clearly we need to keep an eye on. And it, 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 one of the issues might be if you really didn't have much heroin around, whether these things... I mean, I think if you look at the, your hardcore population, they're, they're all mu opioid agonists, you know, so they're all doing much the same thing. So the idea that they might be interchanged is not particularly surprising. Mike, I was wondering if you could uh, say a bit more about what you think would be appropriate policy responses to the emerging psychoactive substances. Well, I think what I said was, one, we need to monitor it. Two, we need to have a measured response and not simply reflexly, uh, particularly the uh, different uh, state governments compete with each other for the number of drugs they can ban in, in a day. Um, and uh, actually, I think we need to look and share experience internationally, both with the UNODC and with the European Monitoring Centre and with the Americans, because the, there's a cat and mouse game going on with drug laws around some of this stuff. And um, the world isn't going to fall apart on it, but we, we, we need to avoid responding too much in haste um, and, and actually figure getting a, a handle on it. The people thought initially the sort of analog laws would work, so you'd simply um, have a type of drug and anything like it. The, I mean, the, the, the real concern is that you might have things that, you, that were medically beneficial and we'll have them outlawed and we won't be able to get access to them. The other concern is, is very, we were going to do monitoring of you know, some purchasing of some of these things this, to get them analysed and see what was in them and that sort of stuff. The minute the law changes, it becomes... Ten times more complicated for us to do that type of work. We, we're recently now, with, with some great cooperation from the police, we're doing cannabis potency. We're publishing some work, I think, later this week on cannabis potency. And it's, it's quite useful work, but it's, once the thing is illegal, it's quite a complicated undertaking. So I think we, I, I think we just need to be aware that th there isn't some simple solution and that the drug laws aren't the only solution. I was just wondering if you could comment on if there's much value in monitoring internet publishing as a um, predictor of you know, future trends or micro-trends. Inter internet publishing? People uh, yeah, putting things on the internet regarding uh, suggested or active drug use. Yeah, I mean, the, the, we do stuff like that. You can do... Um, Google Analytics, where you can actually see, for instance, searches. So you can see a substance, it'll get a little bit of coverage, and you can do it for any region, and you can see how many searches there are on that, and it'll give you an idea of what's happening around something. Um, but again, it's, it's a bit like watching television. It's watching what's happening, you know, and I think in the end of the day, it's, it's a useful window in, but I, d I think it's not... The only thing it's useful from a monitoring point of view, but obviously people won't want us just to watch the thing. They'll want some action at the end of the day, you know. Ophelia. Mm -hmm. uh, um, on the subject of synthetic drugs and policy responses, um, I was wondering whether you described some of the disadvantages of uh, legislative responses, but is there actually any evidence that uh, it has legislative responses um, such as banning those drugs has actually been linked to changes in usage patterns at all? Yeah, I mean, it, one of the things, I chaired the Early Warning Committee from the Monitoring Centre on Drugs and Drug Abuse and for SPICE, which is the equivalent of um, chronic hair, which was basically synthetic cannabinoids sprayed onto herbs. And we went through the whole gamut of stuff pulled the evidence together and said, look, this needs... 
uh, yeah, this should be brought under control. Um, we did the same for methadone, and actually we were quite trying to be quite rigorous around being clear what the harms were. And I think the point is that it's more convincing to people if you say we're banning this because we're clear what the harms are. Uh, we're hearing about hundreds of drugs. I mean, the <clears throat> the one that there's 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 some very toxic drugs out there. And one of the things is we need to be able to identify those and actually take them out of circulation. But w if we do it to everything and it's indiscriminate, I'm not sure that people will, will believe that there's some sort of sensible approach to the thing. So we've got to be clear about what, you know, what are the things that really are nasty and really focus on them, get them out of the system, and then figure out what we do on the softer end. Softer end. I mean, there's... New Zealand is doing something. I'm not clear how the New Zealand model will work, but the New Zealand government have draft legislation that will put the onus on the uh, producers to show that there isn't harm. I don't know where it will fit into the broader regulatory framework, but it will be interesting to see. I, I suspect what will happen there is nothing will meet the standards that will enable it to get through so it'll be it'll be the same thing. But I think you know the, the, we need to be clear that there are significantly harmful drugs. That it's, it's in Europe when methadone was banned, its distribution went down very quickly, and people would bring in some variant. And th then the problem is the problem for the legislators is well, it takes about twelve months to to amass, and even when you're trying to amass the data, there isn't much data. Um, you need to there isn't much toxicology, you, you, need, you really need to have ways to do the toxicology, know what it is, collect the information from the emergency departments about who's turning up, what's, what, what, what they're taking and what problems it's causing, and be pretty measured. I, I think we have no choice but to be structured and measured in our response and not to be excited and reflexive. Okay. Uh, there's more. Well, how are we going to in yeah. Um, what action would you recommend is taken pre and post release drug prison in your house? Yeah, well, I, I, the, it's not just pre and post release. It's it's actually continuity of care across the entire system. We've got to realise that these people, when they're in one bit of the system, it's not there. There's a tendency to think they're then out of another bit of the system rather than. Actually, they're in prison for a few months and they're out, and we've got to have far better continuity across the system. Specifically, one of the issues for a number of states is where people don't have access to, if they're opiate dependent and they've been on medication and they go into prison, they don't have access to it. I think there's a responsibility on the authorities there in terms of the risk they're putting people under. I think it's quite different. I think people will... Um, knowingly and sensibly say they want this opportunity to actually detox and they want to do things and they should be given those threats. We need to be far more, we need to be clear about informing people about the risks when they're leaving. Um, if people want to be on uh, accessing um, substitution treatment, my own personal view is that they should they should have immediate access and we should devise the system so they have immediate access. At the moment, you have people can't get access and they have waiting times and all that. I think it's nonsense. I think there should be a system where you say, sorry, you have an obligation to get people uh, into treatment because they're at risk. And then you've got other, you've got potentially future options like naloxone and what we do around naloxone. And there may be interesting issues around naltrexone too, but I think that's a complicated one that we're a bit well, a bit of, well, well off actually doing the work that's required because we don't have a product at the moment. One more question. Yeah, Luke. Um, uh, Mark, sorry, Don, a couple of years ago, or his group did an interesting study that looked at um, recidivism outcomes for a variety of populations. And one of the things, they, without simplifying the results, they found that people who were mentally ill were less likely to recidivate than people who weren't, but people who had a sort of a coexisting substance abuse disorder and a mental illness or any of these comorbidities had a significantly increased risk of reoffending. So could you speculate on what the relationship is, you think, between what is it that's the amplification effect of being mentally ill and having a substance abuse issue and why that's likely to have an impact on recidivism? Well, 
I, I was John didn't explain to, it. He just actually. I mean, <laughs> th there's two issues in it, isn't there? There's if you look in the prison population, about 10 percent. Uh, I'm not sure what the exact figure is here, but I know in England we 10 percent of the prison population had a psychotic disorder. And when you talk to the clinicians, they say that's far too high. If you talk to the prison, they say that's far too high. It's not that high. And actually you go back, well, no, it actually is, and you go and you look at it. And a very significant proportion of that is related to um, both amphetamine and um, stim psychotogenic type drug consumption. In actual fact, there's an inverse relation between it and heroin. The, the heroin users tend to have a, have a lower incidence of psychosis. Now, my own reading of it is you're, got, you're talking about vulnerable people coming out without much. Uh, if one of the critical issues we know about people coming out of prison is if they don't have much supports, um, they, they get into trouble very quickly and um, they're, ba they're back in prison and the more problematic they are. I've seen people, we, we did one study in England, we saw people and the speed with which they return to prison accelerates, you know, each time the time out gets shorter and shorter for people who really just can't survive outside. And I know they're a subgroup, but they're, they're probably an important part of that, that sort of overlapping subgroup. Okay. Join me in thanking Mark very much. <laughs>